Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, our Ladies East Lansing Meetup this February. Uh, we have Julia Silge with us, who's going to talk to us about uh, tidy models, and Stephanie is going to introduce the speaker. I just wanted to point out a couple of logistics. If you're new, new here, I uh, just wanted to say welcome aboard. And Our Ladies East Lansing is one of 200 uh, chapters of Our Ladies Global, uh, which is uh, an, a nonprofit organization to promote diversity in data science and art programming across the world. Uh, we do observe a strict code of conduct, so please be respectful of the speaker and your other um, participants and attendees. With that, uh, thank you so much. My other co-organizers here today are Kayla and Stephanie. And Stephanie, please take it away. Hi, so I'm Stephanie, um, and I'm really excited to um, first, before I introduce Julia Zilgi, thank all of you guys for um, filling out our Google form to get this Zoom link. It helps us get a little bit more information about people interested in Our Ladies East Lansing and the kind of things that you want to hear about. And um, a poll through one of our Google forms is what um, inspired us to invite Julia today, since so many of our members wanted to hear about machine learning and modeling in R. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll introduce Julia Silgi, who's um, modeling, um, sorry, who's a data scientist and software engineer at R Studio, uh, where she works on open source modeling tools, including um, being one of the authors of the Tidy Models package, as well as the Tidy Text package. Um, she's an author, a keynote speaker all over the world. And importantly, um, she's a real world practitioner of um, data science, focusing on data analysis and machine learning. Um, to that end, if you haven't yet, uh, I'll throw the link in the chat, but everyone should check out um, Julia's blog. She has amazing um, YouTube videos showing uh, great examples of using tidy models and tidy text, especially on the famous Tidy Tuesday data sets um, every week. And it's such a great, um, such a great resource for the community. Uh, Julia especially loves uh, text analysis and making beautiful charts and communicating about um, her topic, her favorite topics, uh, especially R and data science. So we are privileged to have her and um, please take it away, Julia. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Stephanie. I appreciate that so much. I am really glad to be here with you all getting to talk about um, what I work on for my day job here, which is which is tiny models. So before I get started, I want to thank um, um, my former and current um, co-workers, um, Allison Hill and Desiree DeLeon um, uh, for how their um, contributions to this talk, which are like, related to the design of the talk and and both the design and the code there. So many thanks to them both for uh, what they've done that made this talk look as nice as, as it does. So um, um, hello there, everyone. So um, my I'll just tell you a little bit about me before we get started, because I think it's some helpful context. So I um, my my academic background is in physics and astronomy, and I um, I took a bit of a wandering career path like like in academia, teaching, leaving academia, like working at um, a startup. Um, and um, event eventually I heard about this thing called data science. And um, I started um, transitioning to a career in data science about um, seven years or so, seven years ago or something like that. And um, I um, discovered as like, oh, this is such a great um, fit for my interests. Like when I think back to what I did in research, um, that was the most fun for me. You know, it was like writing code to analyze data, making visualizations, communicating about what I was doing. So I was really glad to um, enter into this. And I've worked as a, um, you know, as a, someone with the title data scientist, and I've been at our studio for about the last two years and, and kind of transitioning from maybe 80% data analysis, 20% tool building, kind of now switching that now, or maybe I, now I do like 80% tool building and 20% actually analyzing data, either that belongs to our studio or for teaching purposes or Tidy Tuesday or all that kind of thing. So here are places that you can find me. 
Um, what I work on now is um, tidy models. So at our studio, I'm on one of the open source teams and like the tidyverse team broadly and the tidy models team more specifically. And I work on um, uh, yeah, like this open source software for um, modeling, um, machine learning, and I'm, I'm starting to work more also on um, like ML ops types things, open source software for that. So those are, these are the things I'm interested in because I, what I love, spending time on and understanding is how people really do work in the real world. Um, uh, you know, of course I love, you know, math and, but, and, um, but I am, I really like, if you gave me a choice between working on like some new niche statistical method versus something that like really impacts how people work in the real world, I'm always going to choose that second option. And that's all of what tidy models is about is like how to get, um, uh, modeling and machine learning done in your in a real practical sense. So um, probably um, what I'm about to say is is not news or new to a lot of you, but just to kind of place us in what it is that we're going to talk about. What is it that tidy models do, does? Let's talk about like what is what is machine learning? Like, what do we mean when we say it? So um, this is like a sort of onion shaped model um, from um, from this author about like, what is machine learning? And they would, they, they make the argument that like, if you, t if, if we have this idea of like, we're going to get a computer to learn something um, that like that, there's this broad thing of, of like artificial intelligence, and that can include things like, um, uh, uh, like hard coded rules, you know, or, or like, um, heuristic in like information type decisions. But if then, if we go of like, how do we get computers to make decisions or tell us things and we go in to some, to machine learning, the machine learning is like, not, we're not, we're not hard coding rules based on say experts. Um, instead, we're using data and we're gonna learn from the data what decisions should be or um, what what a result is or what some probability is. And then you may you know may have heard like machine learning, deep learning, like what are all these, what are these things? So one way of building of using data for machine learning, yeah, like there's lots of different ways to take the data to go put it through some algorithm and end up with a, a decision, um, a number, anything like that. So one way to do that is using a kind of model called a neural network. And um, and then if you have a neural networks have a lot of layers, then we put that in there and that's that's deep learning. So um, what I'm gonna be talking, so what tidy models is a, um, framework for is for modeling and machine learning. So kind of that middle, you know, kind of like one of those middle layers of the onions and of the onion here. And we have, you know, you can extend, you know, we have support for neural networks and you can maybe extend it to go to like deep learning layers, but it's, it's, it's kind of all of that whole category of um, what is machine learning. Here's another picture that kind of helps us to say like, what, what is machine learning? So here's more like a concept map kind of way of looking at it. Um, so we've got things, you know, um, if you come from a stats background, you're probably familiar with the stuff over there on the left, like sort of like classical statistical learning. Um, uh, you've got supervised and unsupervised. And then we have sort of more, um, maybe more, um, you know, newer methods or more things that are a little more cutting edge or something like that, like ensembling, where we, you know, we add the things that are over there in the classical, like we, we add them together and very aggregate them in various ways. Um, reinforcement learning, where you, you tell the computer something back and it like learns like more and more. And then over there is like, neural networks, right, um, which are instead of learning a shallow mapping from, say, uh, data like inputs to an output, which the, most of the things in the classical learning learn like a single layer mapping, right, like the neural networks have um, more more complex ways of mapping inputs to whatever output it is you kind of want to do. So I think most people's real world work are kind of where that circle is, you know, like that, that, uh, that supervised classical learning where you've got 
um, you know, either you want to classify something with labels or you want to predict a number with, with regression. Um, and so most of what we're going to be talking about today is in that section. You can do a lot of these other things with tidy models. Um, like if you have unsu you, you don't have labels on your data, you, you need to do something unsupervised. We have methods for that. They mostly live in, in one of the packages. It's called recipes. We've got um, you know, we've got a stacking package, um, we've got bagging, bagging packages, you know, um, uh, that we have, you can do a lot of this with tidy models, but I'm, I want to just kind of focus up there in that corner because that is um, a good place to start and also really a um, really encompasses a lot of people's real world work. Um, so up there, notice we had supervised, we have, we, over here it says classification and regression off of that. Oh, no, wait, sorry. Notice we have supervised and unsupervised off of the classical learning. And um, if you, you're like, ah, I don't know, what, am, what kind of problem do I have? The, 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 the way to know if the problem that you have is supervised or unsupervised is if you have some kind of label on it or not. So if you have, um, if it has a category or a number on it already, and that is the thing that you want to predict for new data, that then that's supervised machine learning. If you want to predict a category or a probability of landing in a category, you're over there in classification. And notice we've got this little example here. Divide the socks up by color, you know. Um, if we want to predict a, a number, that's regression. So these are over here on the supervised side. And um, on the other there on the supervised side, it's like you have data, but um, you don't necessarily have a label on it, like a, like a category or a number. And um, there you can, we can use different kind of algorithms and make, uh, learn different things about data that is not um, super, that is not labeled in any way. We can maybe um, uh, find things that are similar to each other. We can pr uh, project down from like a high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space and like learn um, association rules. So these are, this is, this is like, what is, what is machine learning? Like, what is it? It's, um, it fall, you know, th it's this kind of statistical modeling and it falls into these kind of categories. Um, so I work on software that does a lot of this stuff that's called tidy models. So tidy models is a framework or a collection of packages that um, uses uh, tidyverse principles. So if you have, um, and, and it is in fact, there is a meta package tidy models that you can think of conceptually really similar to tidyverse. So if you have ever typed library tidyverse, and then it says like, oh, you get ggplot2 for visualization, you get um, dplyr for uh, manipulation, you get tidyr for reshaping. You know, you see all these things that get attached when you do um, library tidyverse. Tidy models works in the same way. You, you, you know, if you, um, you know, attach the tidy models packages, you get a bunch of packages here. So, and each of these packages focuses on a different kind of task that is involved in um, uh, modeling and machine learning. So for example, our sample is a package for um, data resampling. We'll talk about that a little bit. Tune is a package for, shockingly, to tuning, like hyperparameter tuning. Um, a yardstick is a package for um, measuring model performance like how do we how do we measure how well a model is performing so all of these um all of these packages are uh built to focus on certain things and then they all work together um uh at least that's the goal right you know i know i think we i think we've got that going pretty well for us so um these these packages are um, focused so that they are um, easier to maintain on our end and easier on your end as a user to be able to divide out if you don't need everything. This especially becomes important when it times comes time to um, deploy a model because you you know you you don't need all of this if you have a fitted train model and it's time to deploy it in a production system you don't need all of these packages you only need the ones that are necessary to make a prediction so building 
a set of modular packages have has a lot of benefits. Um, the benefits are for us and for you. Um, if you were to say, is there any downside to having all these modular packages? Some, if you're getting started with tidy models, you might feel overwhelmed. Like, what are all these packages? What does what? Do I need to worry about like which function, which thing comes from? Um, so, it, like, it can be. Um, it can, when you're learning, you can you can maybe feel like, oh my gosh, what is all this? But I would encourage you to think about it like the tidyverse. Like if it is ever important for you to know like, oh, okay, this function is from tidyr versus dplyr, you know, how would you go about figuring that out? You can take that same sort of mindset to tidy models. It, um, uh, you know, you, there's tools, you know, either in, R itself or, you know, by looking things online to find where something comes from. So let's, um, let's talk about three topics for today. This is this talk is like, what is tidy models? Why, why might you want to use it? Um, and so let's talk about three reasons you might want to use tidy models, three topics for today. The first one is about the models themselves. That's often why, you know, people, um, look at tidy models or, or like they, they're like, ah, I need to, I need to model something. Let me um, talk about what models are. So let's first talk about like what makes a model. Then let's talk about um, spending our data budget. And then last, let's come and, and kind of go backwards a little bit in the process and talk about feature engineering. So first let's start with um, what makes a model. This will be our first, our first of our three topics for today. So um, uh, modeling in R has um, wildly heterogeneous practices around um, uh, how you interact with models, like when you're writing code, how you fit models, how you, um, uh, you know, like execute the models, how do you predict for models. So this, this little child here with their train, picture this person as like, a person writing a modeling package, like a, like a statistical methods kind of package where they're implementing it. And they're like, this is my precious toy. There's nothing like it else out there in the whole world. And I love it. But all the model developers think that way, that theirs is precious and special and different. And so it, um, it's, they all turned out different. <laughs> There's very, um, uh, very um, heterogeneous approaches to trying to fit a model. If you've ever fit a model with say, you know, our friend LM, and then you decide to go to try to do a random forest, you're like, oh my gosh, do I have to totally redo, like I have to think about this totally different because the, the way that I interact with it is different. So um, the package in tidy models that, um, that deals with models is called Parsnip. And so here, this is its package down site here. And so what the what we're doing here with Parsnip is we want a, t a tidy, and in, in that means like pipeable, um, reusable st data structures using tidy data um, interface to models that you can we can try without having to worry about like, uh, exactly how things are different in the underlying packages. So if we like, if you want to look at this example here, let's say you're interested in fitting a random forest model. Um, let's say we've got some, some example data here. Uh, so if you wanted to use the random forest package, you would do it this way. Um, you would, you would need to say, you know, it, it calls it entry, it calls it m try, it calls importance equals true. Ranger, you would have to do it differently. You would have to put different things in here. And also it turns out some of these are in a different order. And let's say actually you're like, ah, I did this, but actually I need to train this in Spark actually. So, and then it's, it's different. It's totally different. It's totally different. Like what need, needs to go in here. So what um, the goals, uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So the goals of Parsnip are to separate um, how we define a model and how we actually execute it with a computer and um, uh, decouple the, the way we're doing things from how it's actually implemented and really harmonize um, arguments names so that we don't have to uh, look all those up and remember that we can work more fluently with different kinds of models. So in tidy models, we, um, uh, 
think about models with three concepts that help us distinguish um, different kinds of implementations from each other. The first is like a model algorithm or like a model, um, uh, 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 like a way, a way to connect input data to some kind of output. The second is the mode. And then the third is the engine. So let's walk through what these three concepts mean in tidy models. So the first is the model. So um, you can find all these different kinds of things at um, tidymodels.org slash find slash parsnip. But we've got all these different kinds and that we hear it's called model type. So we have, you know, a bag decision tree model, you know, we have linear regression. These are all examples of different kinds of algorithms to, um, to connect a input data to some output, you know, category label probability or, or number here. So let's, let's get started with this. So the first, here's how you would specify a linear regression model in tidy models is linear reg. Um, these are optional, these arguments in here, some, some, for some, you know, sometimes there's penalized, there's like regularized regression and there's none, you know, so you can have that or not. The, um, this is a different kind of model. So it's, this is like the main first function that you, come to when you are building a model is you say, okay, what kind, what kind of algorithm I'm going to use? Am I going to use like maybe ordinary least squares, you know, to like connect my input data to some kind of output, or am I going to build a tree? Am I going to build a tree to connect these things to each other? So the, um, these are, these are models. Notice that I, like when I say these, or here's a random forest. So maybe I have one tree, maybe I have a whole bunch of trees and I'm going to like take the average of their votes to make some kind of prediction here. So when I, when you, when you, um, uh, specify these kinds of models, you're not saying anything right now about how you're going to implement it, like in what way you're going to implement it. What you're doing here is you're only talking about um, what kind of model, uh, you know, approach or algorithm are you going to use to map from your input data to whatever it is you need on the output side. So that's the first step, a model type, a model algorithm. The second thing, which is um, uh, that is part of like what makes a model is the mode. So a mode is about um, what kind of problem are you trying to uh, solve. So some kinds of models uh, can only solve one kind of problem. So linear regression linear, linear, our friend linear reg here that we saw before, which tells us it's a linear regression model, um, can only um, solve regression problems. You can't really, you can't, you know, naturally or easily get out um, labels out of linear regression. So, um, so this, this bit I'll hear, it turns out that's actually totally optional. Like you don't have to say that linear reg knows that it is a regression problem. Um, some models, you know, like the, the sort of, uh, other side here, here is, um, uh, the, like a, lo a logistic regression model can only solve classification problems. So these, again, I have this here for, to like talk about what we're doing here and it doesn't hurt you to say that, but, um, it will, um, it will like, that's the default. That's, that's, um, what it knows how to do. Some kinds of problems like, um, like, or sorry, some kind of models like a decision tree can solve multiple types of problems. So you can use a decision tree to fit a classification problem or to fit a regression problem. And so here you do have to set the mode. You have to set the mode of a decision tree model so that, um, so that uh, you, it can be set up to know what kind of problem you're trying to Okay, there. Am I here? Um, the the um, uh, so that is the so that is the mode here. So the um, the kind of modes that we have in tidy models right now are classification, regression, censored regression for um, for um, uh, <clears throat> uh, for survival analysis is also being supported, and we're also looking at like quantile regression and other kinds of modes of the kind of thing that we want to do. 
All right. The, the third and last part of what makes a model is the engine. So think about the engine of a parsnip model as what is actually doing the computations. So um, the same kind of model type and sometimes even the same kind of mode can be implemented by multiple computational engines. So um, a random forest model, like let's, let's take that as an example because it turns out there's quite a lot of options for how you might want to do that um, in R. There is, um, there are R packages um, so when we set an engine that's an R package, what it is is we're saying like, okay, please use this particular underlying R package as the implementation for how, how I want you to um, fit this, how I want you to execute this. There's the Ranger package is another alternative here. So this is another example of an R package. And so when you fit these two things, they work in different ways. You know, like one is faster than the other. One um, uh, has different defaults about, you know, things that it's assumptions it's making about the input. So we've got different things that are going on here. Um, an, an engine doesn't have to be a package in R. Um, uh, the it, it, it also we have other um, other alternatives here. So let's say let's go back to linear reg. So linear reg um, like the default is LM. So if you were not to get, if you were not to put any of this here, it would just assume you wanted to use LM. But uh, sometimes engines and and this is you know just part of base R. It's like ordinary least squares. Like it's it's on all of your computers if you have installed R. Um, but you also can um, uh, use engines that are not R packages. So like an example here is uh, Spark. So if your data is in Spark, you can use linear reg to um, to to not use R to compute the regression, but instead to like use Spark to. So if you have R connected to Spark, we can do this. So this, so we're separating out what do you want to do with how do you want to do this? And this lets you set up for some real success with um, common sort of workflows like, hey, I'm, I'm, um, uh, prototyping some kind of model on my laptop with a subset of data and then I'm going to like where my data is in a like all my data is in some kind of a um, computational situation such as Spark and let, lets us uh, do that fluently without totally starting over with all of the code that we're writing. So to sum up what makes a model here is the kind of um, the kind of model algorithm you want um, to use, what kind of engine you want to use to do it, and then what kind of problem you want to um, solve. So here we've got a ne nearest neighbor model. Um, we're using the KKNN package to do that, and we're solving a regression problem. So any of these you know, things here, we can use other models that are available, other options that are available. And if you're ever like, just show me everything, what's available there? Um, probably that find slash parsnip page at tidy models is probably the best way to look and find that. Um, what this allows you to do is really not get bogged down, but um, uh, in, in, in the minutia of the syntax of these different things, <clears throat> but instead to um, to uh, just deal with like harmonize in a harmonized interface here. <clears throat> so this is um, uh, a comparison of like for a boosted tree model, what do, what are they called? And um, so this is in Parsnip. This first column is what do we call it in Parsnip? What do we call, so XGBoost models, you know, boosted tree models have, um, uh, you know, pretty famously like a ton of different sort of levers you can pull on how it is that you go about um, uh, fitting it and everything you know things have such a different name so like the the actual numbers of trees in the boosted tree model and XGBoost it's called n rounds in C50 which is a um, uh, different tree way of fitting trees um, it's called trials in spark it's called max iter you know you say see the same kind of thing here for um, min n or even m try right which is like a you're like, surely things people can just call things M try. No, no, they're called all these different things, all these different things. And so what Parsnip lets you do is like, okay, I'm just gonna do it here and use it the same across all applications. 
All right, so that is the first the first topic. What makes a model? And like, what are some of these goals here that Parsnip has? Um, so, you know, sum up, um, uh, we want to um, separate the specification of what is you wanna do with executing it so that you have that flexibility and can switch around, try lots of different things, harmonize these interfaces. So then you're like, okay, I've got, I've got a model. I've got some, I've got a model. I decided what I'm gonna try. And now it's time for me to fit it to some data. So let's talk about the tidy models approach for spending your data budget. So the package that um, uh, handles this in tidy models is called R sample. And so, you know, R sample doesn't fit models. What R sample does is it creates um, uh, like resample data sets, handles um, what you need to do to um, to be able to handle your data well within this resampling method. So this is the package downside here so that you can look at it. And just um, uh, one of the benefits of using our sample is that these resampling objects that you create, you know, you're not creating, let's say you're making, you know, 50, 50 bootstrap resamples or something like that. The, um, uh, we, 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 you know, the object that you create is not 50 times as big, right? You copy, you hold one copy of the data set in memory, and then you just keep track of which observations belong to which resamples. So that's a nice, a nice um, characteristic of the way our sample works. So let's talk about the, our data budget, you know, um, in almost in basically all situations when you're it's time, you're like ah it's time for me to do some predictive modeling i've got some data i want to get um, an output for it you have some set of data that you that you ha are going to work with and you have to decide how are you going to spend it so um, you know you i bet almost all of you are familiar with this idea of like splitting your data set into a training set and a testing set and so your training set is um the the substrate or like the the stuff that we use for um for um training obviously fitting tuning choosing models this is where we use that the testing set is what we can use to evaluate the performance of our final model on new data so often the first thing we do when we sit down to do some kind of predictive learn modeling problem is to split our data into training and testing um, and then we'll use the training to like estimate model parameters and then testing to see how well does it do this is because a lot of the you know the model models that we just talked about are can be very powerful and it can be possible to um, uh, to overfit to training data and then be fooled and really disappointed when it comes time to um, to pr uh, predict on new data. So in um, tidy models, we have this concept of a split. So um, the function initial split uh, uh, makes a single split into testing and training. And so let's say this is some data set that we have on uh, houses in Ames, Iowa, that I'll show you here in a little bit. And if we split it into testing and training with um, uh, into like three quarters in training and one quarter in testing, we get out this split object. And so this is what is in the training set. This is what is in the testing set, and this is total. We use these words um, because the what I'll bet I'll show you in just a moment um, that uh, this idea extends not only just to our first split of the data, but also when we can create resampling folds. So this analysis, that's like training. That's what we use for um, modeling fitting an assessment. This is the assessment set. That's like testing, where we're going to see how things turned out. So once you have a split object like this, you can create your training and your testing sets. And notice that these numbers all line up. The training set is three quarters of the data. The testing set is one quarter of the data. And we can um, uh, set up our data sets here. So this gives us a split object. And then calling training or testing gives us data, gives us data back. So we've got training and testing. We're good to go. Let's 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 move on. So it turns out that if you're doing predictive modeling problems, um, the testing set 
is extremely valuable. It's precious. It's precious. And it's precious in the sense that you can only use it one time, you know, maybe if you're going to stretch it um, twice. Um, so the purpose of the testing set is to estimate performance on new data that you have never seen before. It gives you an unbiased, um, uh, or we hope, right, like an unbiased estimate of uh, how your model perform on new data. So given that, like, uh, how, what are we going to do if we need to say compare models like i'm going to try i'm going to try linear regression and a decision tree how do i know which one is better i know that one of those is it's much more likely to overfit um the decision tree so like if i look at the results on the data that i was i trained it with um what am i how will i know how will i know which one to choose or what if i have to tune a model like what if i'm using xgboost and it has a ton of hyperparameters that can't be learned from the data that's trained on and instead i have to try a bunch of them to try so the answer here is that we're going to yes okay so how can we use that training set that i just talked about to compare models to evaluate models and to tune models so the answer here is that we can use resampling so this is the kind of data budget that we recommend for um, you know most situations so you have some some pool of data your total data budget and you first divide that into training and testing and then your training data you create resamplings full re resample folds from so your testing data it is held out it's there for um, till the very very end of your model analysis but your training set you then create um, simulated little versions, simulated new versions of the training set that we, you, we call resamples. And in each one of those resamples, we divide them into an analysis set and an assessment set. And so let's picture ourselves um, tuning a decision tree. So if we, um, if we have uh, our, our decision tree um, and I wanna pay, figure out what are the right parameters for that decision tree, we can't learn it from the input data, they're hyperparameters. Instead, we have to try bunches of different values. So let's say we have uh, five different sets of values for de the decision tree that we wanna try. So for each of these resamples, we, we fit on the analysis set, estimate how it's doing on the assessment set. So fit, fit, um, assess, fit, assess on all these little resampled versions of the of the data set, and then we can use that to decide um, how is it how is it doing how is it doing how, which and which are the bright parameters there. So let's see, I think there, there's a question there like, how can you tell if you have overfit? So um, the so if you have much better performance on one of these analysis sets than these assessment sets, on average, looking at all your resamples, then that it shows you're overfitting. So honestly, it's probably better for many of these models to never look at um, uh, the performance on your now on the data you use to fit the model it's the data that has not been used to fit the model the held out data the out of sample data that lets you see how how you are doing <clears throat> um, if you get to the very end and you look at your testing data and that it's just does way worse than on your training data then you're like oh I overfit probably you, you had some kind of data leakage or something happening so let's talk about how we do this with um, with uh, in the tidy models framework. So a common kind of resampling is called cross validation, v fold cross validation. This is here v is ten. Notice that it says ten fold cross validation. I've stratified it on the. This is a, a data set of housing prices where we were would predict price and. Um, uh, strat stratified resampling means we take something in the data set, like say that price of the houses, and we divide up, say into court like quartiles of the price, and then we do the resampling within each of those buckets, and then put them together afterwards. Stratified resampling is often a good idea, and it very seldom hurts you, so it's often a good thing to do. Okay, so. 
Uh, you're like cross validation. I've heard that before. What actually is it? So the uh, let's say we have our training data here, and um, let's say it's got you know that many observations in it. There's that picture each of those as a house, a house that we know the price of. So um, for v fold cross validation, we pick a number v here. That number is five, and we divide each of our we divide our total training data up into five folds, five groups here and um, here they are numbered and in um, for v fold cross validation we make uh, if we have five here we're going to end up with five resamples five splits of the data in the first one uh, let's say we keep fold one as the one that we do not use to fit any models and the other folds all go in to fitting the model so in this in this example folds two through five would be in the um, analysis set so that's the analog of a training set and fold one would be held back and would be used only for assessing so you would not use the data any of the data that you use to train to assess and in split two, we would we would shift it down and so forth. Um, and we end up with five resamples with V full cross validation. You end up with V resamples here. So and notice here that none of the data that is used to fit any of these models is used to assess them. And so this is how you can be uh, this. I'm like, whoa, I got some real end of the day glare here. Let me see if I can fix that at all. Um, maybe not. Okay, um, so we end up with five folds that we can use um, to fit the fit our model, say five times, and um, then we'll have five estimates of performance. And each one of those estimates will not have used um, the uh, any of the training data to assess. So the um, they, there's actually so that there's a great question about how what's the optimum number of folds, and there are. Um, mainly simulation papers that people use to answer that question like let's take various um fake data sets that we know the answers to and let's you know do massive simulations to um picture look at like what 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 ends up in the right that gives you the best results and um like five to ten it turns out to be the best numbers for um v-fold uh cross validation so um you end up with uh, much, you don't really ever get much improvement past that and and fewer than five doesn't really um, get you enough estimates of how well your model is performing to feel very confident about it. So five to 10, it turns out is just for, just uh, empirically has been found to be the right the right number. So um, the next question is about data leakage and I'll talk about that actually a little more um, a little more in the last section when we talk about feature engineering. So I'll probably um, punt that question until we get there. When it comes to, so I, I would say when it comes to predictive modeling, most people have seen you know something like this before. You know where you're like um, you're like okay here here are all the data the data observations we got to divide them out. We can't use the data that we train on to also estimate how well we're doing. So when it comes to model estimation, I think the machine learning community, the um, education materials, how you hear it talked about, you, um, we don't, we, we often are getting this right. This, this like, I have to separate what I'm testing on my training on. Well, I'll come back to this issue of data leakage when we talk about feature engineering. So here, like here, we're back here. So let's look at what is here. So I, the default here is 10. You can change that for using a V argument in here. But notice I've got 10 splits. And each of these splits, this much data is in the analysis set, which is like a training set. And this much data is in a um, assessment set, which is like a testing set. And so if I were to you know, fit a model to this data, I would fit it 10 times and each time it would get fit to about this much and each time I could assess it on this much and estimate how well it is. Notice that this is not, this is no longer a huge number, you know, like this is now getting small and so that's often when you end up deciding how many folds, should you look at some other alternative and so, so forth. There's, um, uh, in tidy models, we have um, multiple 
you know, of the common, uh, you know, resampling methods that you will often want to use in um, uh, machine learning, you know, uh, Monte Carlo cross validation, bootstraps, which is also often good if you have less data, you know, you can use that. And so what resampling methods allow you to do is to spend your data wisely. Uh, you, you have a certain budget of data. Often we're not in the situation where it's like, well, I'll just double the amount of 10 times the amount of data I have and then I'll be able to do a better job. Even even then, if you do that, you still have to decide how, you know, how are you going to decide to create a data budget here? And these are like simulated validation sets. In tidy models, a um, validation set uh, it, we think of as just like a single resample. So we, we support that as well. If you've got a ton of data and you just want to uh, validate at one time, we can do that too. All right, and let, now let's come to our last topic. So this is the last topic, uh, the last sort of reason why you might want to consider tidy models. And this is us going back to the beginning, by going back to the start of our process, um, feature engineering. So um, uh, we've talked about um, we're kind of moving backwards a little bit when it comes to um, like through the process when actually having a model is not um, often one of the first decisions you have to make. So the package that handles uh, feature engineering, also called data preprocessing in um, <clears throat> tidy models is called recipes. So recipes is set up to use like tidyverse dplyr style pipeable sequences of feature engineering steps. The goal here is to get your data ready for modeling. So that so it's um it's a it's called recipes because the an, the analogy here is that you um that recipes have steps that you go through and you can get different results by doing things in different steps. And so recipes are for feature engineering. So the idea here is that you have some data, right, that you start with, and um, feature engineering lets you build better predictors. So this man here is um, <clears throat> sweeping up a pile of trash, <laughs> pile of garbage, and if you've got like garbage data, <clears throat> um, uh, feature engineering is not going to help you, but maybe maybe these are like leaves or something. And he is um, he is he is changing what he has so that um, he can use the input that he has to build better predictors. So to build a recipe, um, you start with the recipe function that um, and what we do is here is we say what are our ingredients like what are the variables that are involved and then we describe our pre processing step by step and you can keep adding depending on what's uh, appropriate for you. So this is that beginning, that beginning process. So <clears throat> I say, hey, I'm going to do some data pre processing. I am going to do some uh, feature engineering. I have got um, some data, like uh, the Ames data, and then I am going to um, I'm, I'm going to predict sale price. This is my predictor, and everything else um, is going to be uh, this is my outcome, and everything else is going to be a feature, a predictor here. Um, we you can then go through and add steps. So let's like if we scroll through here, these are all different kinds of steps that you can use to um, uh, pre-process your data in the way that you need to. So there's lots of options. Um, you can encode categorical predictors. Say you have, um, you know, like a factor and, and the <clears throat> model algorithm that you want to use does not natively handle factors. So you can make um, dummy or indicator variables from them. You can center and scale variables. Some models like, you know, I, I showed a k-nearest neighbors model. Um, if, if one of your inputs is like um, number of bedrooms and one of your inputs is like square footage, um, something, anything that uses some kind of similarity is not going to be able to handle that very well. So you can center and scale your variable to make that work better. Maybe you have class imbalance. Maybe you're predicting a, a, something like a probability and you've got a ton more of one class than the other. You can handle that in feature engineering with recipes. You can impute missing data, perform dimensionality regression. There's, there's a whole wide swath of things that we can use as feature engineering to um, 
build better predictors from the data that you have. So here is what that, um, what that might look like. So let's say we've got that um, housing data from Ames, Iowa, and let's say we want to, we want to do some things to the nominal predictors like, hey, <clears throat> please set this up so that you know what to do if I see a new level <clears throat> in uh, say like in new data, let's create dummy or indicator variables. Let's, um, let's remove anything that has zero variance so that my model doesn't like die on me. Um, and then we can do this normalizing, centering and scaling and making, make some principal component, um, like learn some new principal component, uh, uh, features from the data that I have. So this is like an example of what a recipe might look look like <clears throat> um, when we have some data and we want to get it to ready as input in a different way. <clears throat> so the what we do to a re so this is much like the model where we separate the specification from the um, execution. All we've done here is say what we want to do. When we prep a recipe, we actually learn all those um, parameters that we need from the training data. So prep, so for a recipe, if you're gonna compare like a recipe and a model, prep is like fit. So think of prep like fit. What we're doing is we're going to the training data and we're saying, okay, um, like here, for example, what are the means and the standard deviations for all of these variables that I have. I want you to learn from the training data so that then I could then apply that somewhere else. Here, what we're doing is we, we're learning the, the principal component, um, like learning principal components from the training data, and then we will store them so that if like a new observation comes in, we can then apply it to new data. So prep is like fit. Um, uh, and this is where I do want to just come back to this idea of uh, data leakage and learning from training data. So um, <clears throat> uh, f I think the most common place that data leakage pops in kind of today is in feature engineering. You do something like you compute TF-IDF, uh, you know, for all the data in your in your trainings that you have available, instead of holding some back and figuring out what you're going to do when a new word comes in, maybe for text data, or or you um, you you know you compute even something pretty straightforward like the mean or the standard deviation. You do that for all your data, and that instead of a subset of the data. So if we have old data and we pre-process it here, um, what? prepping your feature engineering um, process is what lets you avoid data leakage in feature engineering. And so you will learn, say, um, the means and the standard deviations from the training data and then apply it to the new data. So prep is to a recipe as fit is to a model. And so we can have this, um, this uh, uh, sort of schematic of what it is that hap that happens during machine learning. Machine learning is not all just the um, is not all just the the model parameters. It's also the feature engineering um, estimates of what you need for that. So that is, I'll sum up here, there, this is, was three, you know, three sort of reasons you might want to use tidy models because of our, our approaches to these things. There's lots more to learn. I'll point you to a couple things here. Um, tidymodels.org is a great place to start. Um, it's a really good place if you're like, okay, how do I actually do this? Let me learn. Um, this, which I will uh, open in a new tab here, so you can see this here, is um, a more in-depth book. So this is um, this is a book that uh, we're publishing with O'Reilly. We're in the process of getting that all in, and it's it's almost almost ready for to publish here. And the um, the this is more if you want to go in depth. So you know you kind of have this beginning section that tells you how to get started, and then moving forward into more um, other topics like, um, say, like explainability, um, dimensionality reduction, and you know tuning things like that. So that's another great um, thing to do. I have this. Um, uh, if you are someone that likes to learn interactively through a course, I have this here, which. Um, 
uh, it walks you through how to learn tiny models and um, you can you can find us at other areas and if you're specifically were interested in feature engineering this is a book by my box boss and collaborator max which is all about um, feature engineering here so these are places to to you know go from here and learn more um awesome so thank you so much i probably i know i'm right at five right now but i've got a little bit of time and can take some questions if people are able to stick around all right let's look at these questions um okay so is there a reasonable way to use dates um interval duration so if you're interested in here i'll go here if you're interested in dates uh tidy models um if you're interested in dates i recommend that you um look at where did it go it's an individual okay so there's step date and step yeah here it is step date and then there's also step holiday so um it helps you um create new features so um, if you've got a date in r you can create say a day of the week feature what month what year is it so you can convert from like a date to things that may be more helpful in your um uh in your model like hey actually i think there's something like um uh for 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 dates there and you can do th other things like day of the year day of you know what quarter are you are you in and so forth here but these are the defaults here so that is really helpful step holiday um will uh for a set of holidays will like say like oh this is um uh uh th this will help you um find out you know what's there if you're interested in intervals i am going to point uh point you to um um i think it's the time tk package uh which can um uh help you create features for um features for a time series if you want like a lagging type thing the other thing i'm gonna say that you can use um we do we do have step like step lag and these rolling like that lets you like find values over rolling integers. so we've got pretty good support for that um there is a oh and there, i saw a question a while back it's like hey have you made some kind of um you know uh visualization or something that helps us know like what these packages are and the closest we've come to that right now is where'd it go um, so like you probably, you know, you maybe some have seen this about like the data science process. Um, this is the closest that we have right now to like um, the typical modeling process and um, <clears throat> that like, what is it like? You, you know, you do feature engineering, you try models, you evaluate them, you see which ones work better and worse. You do more feature engineering, you make refined models and so forth. We don't really have the packages names on here yet because um, I'm not sure if that's that helpful or not for people, but we've, we've talked about doing that. Um, so resampling for time series, there's a question about that. Um, and so there's a couple of options that you have here. If you're more in the um, fairly uh, fairly straightforward, um, you can use uh, it's re our, our sample has support for um, for a sliding and also rolling origin resampling. So this you can create these. Um, uh uh resamples say 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 you've got resample like you've got data that's actually like time series and you're like i want to make resamples that slide along my data so that i can see if i test on say the first on, on two months and evaluate on one month and then i want to slide forward test on or fit on two months evaluate on one month and you can like slide through your data set that way the um the resampling, the sliding resampling, and the other one is, um, where'd it go? Rolling origin forecast resampling. These are the ones that you probably wanna look at for that. They, um, Matt Dancho also has another package that can help you create uh, like cross-validation folds. So that would be what I would look at. Um, there's a question like, where do you just start? Oh, oh yeah, oh. go ahead, sorry. 
Sorry to interrupt, but there are also a few questions that came in during your talk around 6.45 okay. p.m. EST. Yes. Okay. okay, so I looked at the flow diagram. I think I got these. Okay. The, yeah, okay. I think I got I these. Just, want, just wanted to make sure that the ones on top for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if you are like, I am just starting, I am just starting, where, what do I do? I think the best place to start is at tidy models slash start. So like this is the place to start if you are like, tell me what's going on. If you, um, so using tidy models probably does, um, you do probably, it's probably not the best thing to start learning R with. You might want to, you might want to um, look at some of these. If you're like very, very new, you might want to look at some of these resources first and then come to tidy models because you probably do want to be able to, you know, handle things pretty fluently in R to start with before you start um, modeling. Um, recipe, um, recipes, uh, uh, I'm not sure what robust standardization means. I think, um, so if you are interested in um, centering and scaling, or we have a step normalize, which, let's see, where is it? Uh, yeah, there we go. So we've got, here are sort of the options for normalization of your data. Most people who say standardization usually mean this. Um, it, it will normalize it to have a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero. Um, so we've got, you know, various options there. And let's see anything else that we've got that. Yeah, Andrew Crouch has some great things. Um, all right, so I'm going to, any other things that I might want to show people? No, okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And... Um, and see if anybody else has any other things they'd like to talk about or ask. Yes, Arjun. Hey, thanks. Hey, Julia. Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation. I have a couple of very high-level questions okay. about the thinking behind, you know, tidy models. So, in first, uh, first the recipes thing really reminded me of these numerical recipe books like C C plus <laughs> plus from long time. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. My my. My background is like uh, C and numerical recipes and all that. And so we're, you know, we're definitely evoking that um, analogy yeah. of like, you can put things together in that way. Awesome, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So I think the first question really is, uh, you had this analysis and assess terms, right? Well, why did you feel the need to invent these terms? Because the whole field is talking about training, validation and testing. Yeah. Okay. So, cause we really think it's good to talk about a test set as, um, as, your in your total data pool let's call it your total data budget yeah. the test set is what you hold back and yeah. is um only used once or once or twice mm -hmm. and so when you go into the resamples <clears throat> we thought it would be confusing to say oh you're training in your test set but in your resamples mm -hmm. um we wanted to be really clear like test set pretty much means one thing and we didn't want to um use that word to talk about data that actually came from the training set because like this is one of the like really really important things right for us all to like realize yeah. like you can only use that to test that one time yeah. um in, in almost all situations and so like we want we were like let's come up with some you know similar terms that evoke that idea that we can apply to data that actually came from the training set okay got it thanks uh, and then the other question is, I really like this uh, tidy models idea because, I mean, one of the reasons, for example, uh, Python is very famous for, you know, machine learning is because there is one scikit learn framework. And then people can sort of understand what an object, machine learning object at various stages of machine learning is. And it's wonderful to see this. So in, in the future, is there, you know, uh, ideas for collaborating with all these folks who develop machine learning algorithms and implement them in R to actually adopt tidy models in some way? To me, make this as consistent as possible going forward. Yeah, yeah. So if you are a model developer, what we 
have is this package called um, Hard Hat. I will put it in, I'll put the link here in case anyone is interested in this. And so Hard Hat is a package for someone who is maybe implementing a new model, like a new statistical method. Mm -hmm. You can use Hard Hat to um, build a package that is easy for other people to work with. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it makes it easy just in general. Like it makes it easy to integrate with tidy models, but it also makes it just easy in general <laughs> to collaborate with. The other thing that we have talked about is um, uh, we have a, like a short sort of um, set of like books. I don't know if you want to call it that, but um, not, not it's like a sort of bookish type thing that I'll put um here and this so if you're if you're like ah i'm interested in developing a new model you know like the this this is the kind of thing that we talk about being important for like a for like a easy to program against easy to um for people to extend you know like these are things you need to think about okay uh great hard hard is a great name for a package <laughs> thanks yeah. for the presentation <laughs> thank you for your questions um, I see that Peter has a question about um, templates, like for maybe getting started. Um, and yes, so there's a couple of things. Uh, let's see if I do I have a I will let me just open a brand new our studio. Like a brand new session and then I'll share my screen again real briefly. Uh, OK, so. Um, let me share my screen real briefly. So here's something I just want to make sure you know about. Uh, okay, so this is like a brand new, ignore what's at the top, um, <laughs> brand new session. So if I go to file, new file, our markdown, oh, you might not be able to see that because I'm just sharing this window. Okay, uh, darn it. Um, I am gonna. Yeah, we do see your pop up if that's what you're talking. Oh, about. you do see the pop up? Yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, good. Okay, so if you go to from template, and if you have the tidy models package installed, there's a model analysis template here, and if you open it, it opens up this. Um, a template for how to get started with tidy models and it's, it uses Palmer penguins here, but like what you would do is you would like read in your own data here and then it would it would remind you of the important things to do, for example, like hey you should do some EDA hey. Um, you, how do you go about building a model, you know it starts out with like spend your data budget um, create a model specification, how do you go about combining these things and evaluating so this is something that is available that I think is a great way if you're like, ah, what are the steps again? What do I need to do? Use this our markdown template. Um, and then, you know, delete all the stuff that you don't need or that doesn't apply to you. Um, and it even talks about like, if you wanna deploy this model, like what should you do? Like, what do you need to use to um, uh, save this to be able to use later? So the, um, the our markdown, um template is a great thing to use the other thing that i want to talk about is um the use models package um here so this is a package that you can install and it for for some like common models like say i want to use ranger or i want to use um glimnet like you what you do is you pass it your you if you say that use glimnet um function you pass in like a formula saying what i want to predict with and to and the data and then it generates all the rest of that for you and so it's kind of like best practices of what to get started with and then the other only thing let me let me share this again the other thing i want to just make sure you all know about is if is there is a um uh, where did add-ins add-ins so if you have installed packages you probably got a, like a bunch of add-ins here and there is a parsnip add-in where did it go? Parsnip, parsnip, the parsnip um, here. Um, and this pops up this here and you can say, uh, okay, I'm going to do a regression model. I'm not going to, I don't want to tune these. I'm just getting started. And then it's like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to do an XGBoost model. I'm going to do Glimnet. I'm going to do, is it a Poisson model? No, let's say it's not a Poisson model. Then I want to do Ranger. And if I, and I say, write this code. 
and it, where did, oh yeah, ah, <laughs> it popped it all here. I should, let me show you. The, so if I was in an R, I, I did it wrong. If I'm here and I say write specification code, uh, what did I do wrong? Here, and I click this, it pops it all out there for me. So that you're like, ah, I want to do a bunch of these and try them. And it, so this is here as well for you to, to um, use. And like, these are sort of tools for just making it easier to get started or, you know, like it, it is a little bit of verbose code. Like tidy models code is kind of verbose code. It's not like, um, you know, if you're used to writing LM and um, you're like, now I would like you to write three lines with two pipes and, you know, like it is a little bit of verbose. It, there's good reasons why it's so verbose, but um, uh, these kind of support you generating that code in an easier way. Yeah, okay, I I have said it both ways, GLMnet, Glimnet. I hear other people saying it both ways. I don't even know. It's like a GIF GIF situation. I don't know actually how to say it. <laughs> I have a question. Um, yes. If say that I'm, I don't have any sort of limitation on, you know, the amount of processing power that I have on my machine, I'm running on HPC, something like that. Is there a limitation just based on tidy models on sort of the size of a data set that you can use for, um, for building your models? Um, no, it's like just the same as just R, you know, like if you can get it into R, it's fine. And our, our choices around resampling um, are, are as memory efficient as a possible and our choices around tuning and whatnot. So what you, um, uh, you know, you know, like it's just, it's the same limitations as modeling in R in general, you know, and a lot of our choices around tuning are, are the defaults are to be as efficient as possible. So for example, we don't keep around all the fitted model objects. Once we've evaluated with them, it's like throw them away. Cause if you're just using them to estimate performance, you don't, you don't need to keep those around. So, um, uh, no, no. So if you were to say like, why use why not use tidy models you know it's not because of it limits you in memory there is a there's a slight um uh overhead to using tidy models in term in terms of memory like uh uh it's it's quite small um but like if you can imagine you like take a model and you wrap it in another function like you get that slight overhead but passing through functions is quite efficient in r so it's not um it, it for I would it's it's not for most people's use cases that they run up against that and it's like oh I hate it you know like why is it so slow um it's it it's not that much slower than if you were doing that same data set outside of tidy models there's just like this slight overhead in terms of speed and memory great thank you so much um any other questions or thoughts. This was fantastic. And I think we should do this again soon. <laughs> Maybe not soon, but hopefully we'll invite you for more of tidy text or any other kinds of talks. This was really brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank Julia. you. That's really kind. Thank you. I'd also love at some point to host um, our members at a meetup showing how they've used tidy models or how they've modeled in R. That would be super exciting. So get into it. Start using this and want to want to share what you've done. That'd be cool. All right. Well, Julia, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone for coming. And um, please apologize to any of your uh, colleagues if they had trouble getting the Zoom link. We had a bit of an uh, automatic email sending out crash um, earlier. So uh, just remind everyone, we'll remind everyone that the video will be posted soon on our GitHub. And um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Thank you.